Here's the event. Hi, everybody. My name is Jeff Sebo. Welcome to this event. Thank you for being here during what I know is a very busy week and day for everybody. This is the first day of class at NYU. And the fact that we have an event today with this many people interested, I think, is a testament to how interesting the topic and, and the report that will be the basis for our conversation are. So uh, this is an event hosted by the NYU Mind Ethics and Policy Program. And we are also grateful to our co-sponsors, the NYU Center for Bioethics and the NYU Center for Mind, Brain and Consciousness. Thank you for co-sponsoring this event. The NYU Mind Ethics and Policy Program examines the nature and intrinsic value of non-human minds, including biological and non-biological minds with special focus on invertebrates and artificial intelligent systems. We are interested in examining what kinds of beings can be conscious and sentient and sapient and what kinds of moral and legal and political status they should have. And so we were very interested when this team released this report about a week ago, a report on what leading scientific theories of consciousness have to say about possible AI consciousness. And so we thought it would be useful, especially since the report as soon as it was released, was generating a lot of discussion. It received coverage in nature and science and a lot of conversation on the internet. We thought it would be valuable to bring some of the authors of the report together. There were 19 authors from different fields and different institutes, and we thought we could bring four of them together, including the two lead authors and representatives of other fields as well, to talk about the report, summarize some of the main points, and then offer their own individual perspectives about some of the implications. So I will now briefly introduce the speakers and then we can hear uh, some remarks from them and then we can open up the discussion and hear questions and comments from you and, and have a conversation. So here are the speakers. Patrick Butlin is a philosopher of mind and cognitive science and a research fellow at the Future of Humanity Institute at the University of Oxford. His current research is on consciousness, agency and other mental capacities and attributes in AI. Robert Long is a research affiliate at the Center for AI Safety. He recently completed his PhD in philosophy at New York University, during which he also worked as a research fellow at the Future of Humanity Institute. He works on issues related to possible AI consciousness and sentience. Yashua Bengio is recognized worldwide as one of the leading experts in artificial intelligence, known for his conceptual and engineering breakthroughs in artificial neural networks and deep learning. He is a full professor in the Department of Computer Science and Operations Research at the University de Montreal and the founder and scientific director of Mila Quebec AI Institute, one of the world's largest academic institutes in deep learning. He is also the winner of many awards and has many other accomplishments that you can easily find online. And finally, Grace Lindsay is currently an assistant professor of psychology and data science at New York University. After a BS in neuroscience from the University of Pittsburgh and a year at the Bernstein Center for Computational Neuroscience in Freiburg, Germany, Grace got her PhD at the Center for Theoretical Neuroscience at Columbia University in the lab of Ken Miller. Following that, she was a Sainsbury Welcome Center Gatsby Computational Neuroscience Unit Research Fellow at University College London. So thank you all so much for, first of all, writing this very interesting report, and second of all, being here to talk with us about it. I know a lot of people here are interested in hearing from you and discussing this with you. Just a note to everybody that the format and structure of this event will be that we will hear brief remarks from each of the four authors and speakers. Uh, Patrick and Rob will speak together about a summary of the report, followed by a philosophical perspective, and then we can hear uh, cognitive science and computer science perspectives from uh, Grace and, and Yashua, respectively. And all along the way, people in the audience can submit questions and comments, objections, whatever you like, in the Q&A tab on Zoom. And then when we reach the discussion portion of this event, I can read uh, questions, comments, objections that have been entered and upvoted from the Q&A tab. So, so please go ahead and open that up and add your questions and comments whenever you like throughout the, the session. Okay. Uh, so with that in mind, without further ado, we can start the show. Uh, so, so Patrick and Rob, whenever you are ready, feel free to share your screen and tell us about your report. All right. Um, so here we go, uh, Jeff, and if you can let me know that everything is in working order, 
You've Everything is in working order. Yep, go for it. Uh, excellent. So let's begin. Yeah, first, I just want to say thank you so much uh, to the audience for turning out. We're extremely excited to discuss these issues with you. That's a big part of why we wrote this report, is to uh, discuss these topics more widely uh, and hear from different people. And thanks so much uh, to you, Jeff, uh, and to the NYU Mind Ethics and Policy Program for hosting this. So my name is Robert Long, uh, and along with uh, Patrick Butlin, I'm one of the uh, lead authors on this report. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, there are also 17 uh, esteemed colleagues from various disciplines. And I'm going to briefly say what we did in the report uh, and why we did it and why it matters. And uh, I mean, Patrick will be covering some of that. So you've all probably read about the case of Blake Lemoyne, a Google engineer who was fired from Google after he became convinced that an AI system he was interacting with was conscious. You've probably seen the increased deployment of chatbots, including romantic chatbots that interact with people in very human-like compelling ways. And you may have seen a tweet from uh, OpenAI's chief scientist, Ilya Sutskever, saying that it may be that today's large neural networks are slightly conscious. So AI consciousness is obviously a topic of increasing public concern and public interest. And it's also a perennially fascinating scientific question. Speaking for myself, as AI consciousness has become a bigger topic recently, I've often been frustrated by some of the characteristics that conversation about it has. I think when people talk about AI consciousness, there's often a lack of specific scientific evidence. There's very little detailed analysis of existing systems. The conversation is often kind of emotive and highly charged and often in dichotomies like how could AI systems possibly be conscious? We know that that's absurd. Or on the other hand, people being certain that they definitely are conscious. And what we wanted to provide in this report is kind of a better footing for these kinds of conversations. We want to bring a more nuanced and a more evidence-based approach to the report. So in addition to the actual findings that we have, we really want to spur a conversation and spur further research along these lines. So one aspect that I'm going to talk about briefly is also conceptual clarity, uh, something that philosophers love, um, about what exactly we're talking about when we talk about AI consciousness. And before I do that, uh, again, just an advertisement for the paper. We put it up on archive about two weeks ago, I think. Um, and you can find it there. And there is a uh, list of this uh, really wonderful team that helped us out. We have people from neuroscience, AI, uh, and philosophy. Um, so there it is. So what are we talking about in this report? It's called uh, Consciousness in AI, Insights from the Science of Consciousness. It's very important both in this talk and we do this in the paper to pin down what we're talking about. So what I'll be talking about and what we discuss in the paper is what philosophers call phenomenal consciousness. And this means subjective experience. Uh, Thomas Nagel famously said that consciousness is what it is like to be an entity. So for example, if you've tuned in, you're now currently listening to my voice. Uh, you're seeing my face and this wall on the screen. And there's a subjective aspect to your experience. There's something that it's like for you to be seeing a white wall or hearing my voice. And what we're asking about in this report is whether AI systems now or in the near future could have subjective experiences in this way, if they could be conscious in this sense. And it's very important in conversations about this to be clear about what we're not talking about. We're not talking about uh, whether AI systems are intelligent in a certain way. We're certainly not talking about AGI or artificial general intelligence. We're not talking about language understanding or rationality. And also we're not talking about whether AI systems experience the world in exactly the way that humans do. So Thomas Nagel, when he introduced this phrase, famously asked what it's like to be a bat. It's very plausible that bats might be conscious, that they might have subjective experiences of the world. But if they are, the way that they experience the world is presumably very different than the way we experience the world. And that also comes along with the fact that the way they think uh, about the world is presumably very different. And they don't have the full suite of human cognitive capacities. So when we're talking about AI, we're wondering about consciousness in this sense and not necessarily any further assumptions about human-like intelligence or experiences. So how do we go about this in this report? Here's what I think are kind of the main 
uh, foundations of what we do. First of all, we want the conversation to be empirical. So that means that we're looking at scientific theories of consciousness. Uh, so there's a broad field of consciousness science where scientists examine the human brain and animal brains and ask what sort of processes are associated with having conscious experiences. And this is somewhat distinct from philosophical questions about consciousness. We're gonna look at these empirical theories and see what they can tell us about potential AI consciousness. Another key aspect is that we take this working assumption of this very broad thesis about the nature of consciousness, uh, which we call computational functionalism. And very broadly, this is saying that what matters for consciousness is the computations that a system performs and not necessarily what it's made of. So this is compatible with consciousness uh, coming from computations done by biological neurons or computations happening in silicon transistors and chips. Patrick's gonna talk a little bit more about exactly why we made this assumption and what it amounts to. And then we try to get precise. We try to derive indicator properties from the science of consciousness that we can use to examine different AI systems. And then we apply these to a broad class of AI systems from several different kinds of um, research programs, several different kinds of systems. And lastly, we're not aiming for absolute certainty. If I, it's my opinion, and I think most of my co-authors, if you're asking for absolute certainty about AI consciousness, you are going to be disappointed because there still is a lot we don't know about consciousness. That's in spite of the fact that we do know some things, which is what we try to show in this report. So it's a long report. So I would like to just talk about one specific example of this methodology and how it works in the paper. So one of the most prominent scientific theories of consciousness is called the global workspace theory. And at a broad level, the global workspace theory says that consciousness is about global broadcast throughout a system. So it has this picture of the mind where there are these specialized independent modules that are responsible for different kinds of information processing. So for example, as you can see in that diagram, one such module might be perceptual processing. So vision is responsible for visual information processing, or maybe there's a module dedicated to making decisions and choosing actions. The global workspace theory says that there's also a global workspace that will select the output from one of these usually independent modules, and then broadcast that to all of the modules. This is a way of coordinating uh, all of the processing that they are each doing individually. And so consciousness is related to global broadcast of information throughout a system and a system having a certain uh, architectural or information processing property. That's related to the computational functionalist uh, assumption that we have. And importantly, as we'll see, there needs to be a certain kind of feedback loop between modules and a global workspace. Uh, the global workspace taking input from the modules and then also broadcasting it back to them. So from that, we get some indicator properties to say what kind of features does an AI system need to have if it's going to satisfy, at least according to global workspace theory, the indicators that might be associated with consciousness. So, you know, one of the top questions you might have is, well, what do we say about large language models? Um, so briefly, you know, large language models, uh, you're probably all familiar with them. These are uh, some of the most prominent systems today. Uh, the GPT systems are an example. These are often built with what's called the transformer architecture. And now is certainly not a time for a full explanation of what that amounts to. But one key aspect for our analysis is that the transformer architecture is feed forward. And that is to say, when the system is taking in an input, say a certain amount of text, and it's going to produce an output, which is the text that it will continue to produce, for example, when you're chatting with it, as it's processing that information, the information just goes from the input layer to the output layer kind of continuously. And when we look at this architecture and, and ask whether the way that information is flowing through it kind of fits with the picture from global workspace theory, our provisional analysis in the paper is that as far as we can tell, there's nothing like a global workspace that is both receiving and broadcasting information to and from anything like individual modules. To put it another way, there don't seem to be the right kind of feedback loops in the transformer architecture for it to be satisfying these particular indicators of consciousness. So our answer in the, the paper is probably not. According to global workspace theory, they do not satisfy these indicators. 
So that's the kind of thing we do in the paper. Take a scientific theory, ask more precisely what kind of architectural and informational processing features it says are associated with consciousness, look at how an AI system works and see how much it matches that. As I said, we do this with a lot of theories. Um, we, we have like five very prominent uh, scientific theories of consciousness that we look at. One thing that's worth remarking on is why do we look at five different theories? Why not just, for example, go with global work theory? And that's kind of related to our points about nuance and uncertainty. We do think that the science of, of consciousness is making progress on discovering the processes associated with consciousness, but we think it's premature to commit to one particular theory. There's nothing like a consensus in consciousness science about which one of these stories is the right one for consciousness. So we kind of want to cast a broad net and say, here are a variety of things that might be associated with consciousness according to different theories, and let's look at all of them. Jeff, I saw that my internet said it was unstable. Did I skip at all? Or are we good? Uh, briefly, but but I heard everything you were saying. Cool. And yeah, as mentioned, uh, one thing that we think it's important to do is look beyond just large language models. They have understandably received a lot of the attention. They're very compelling. Their capabilities are extremely impressive. And most saliently, they sometimes say that they're conscious. So it's understandable that they're one of the main systems that people wonder about. But at least speaking for myself, I think when you look at the way that they're built, they're not necessarily even the best current candidates for consciousness among the AI systems that exist today. For example, many people point out that large language models don't seem like they're agents or they don't seem embodied. They don't seem to interact continuously with an environment, which you might think is important for consciousness. But many systems are plausibly much closer to doing that sort of thing, which is why we look at systems that are from robotics uh, or that navigate virtual environments or that work in different ways than large language models do. And I will now turn things over to my colleague, Patrick. Thanks, Rob. Hi, everyone. So Rob's talked a bit about um, what we did in this project. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly about why we did things in the way that we did. And then I'm also going to uh, comment very briefly on what's next for research in this area. Um, so next slide, please, Rob. OK, so on the topic of why we did things the way we did, uh, the first question I want to say something about is, um, why did we make the assumption of computational functionalism? Um, and this is this is an important question because computational functionalism uh, is quite a contentious uh, hypothesis. So just to remind you about uh, what this what this claim is, computational functionalism, as Rob said, is the claim that what matters for consciousness is computations. So according to this view, the reason why um, humans are conscious is that the right kinds of computations are going on in our brains. And what it would take for an AI system to be conscious is for it to perform the right kind of computations. Now, this is, as I just said, quite a controversial hypothesis. Um, many researchers in this area um, doubt it. Um, for example, uh, Anil Seth uh, suggests that consciousness may require living cells, and there's many other researchers who take similar views to that position. So why do we make this assumption? Well, there's a few factors that play into this. Um, one is that we think that computational functionalism um, is a plausible view. That doesn't mean to say that we're confident that it's true. Um, uh, I think there's probably a range of views about computational functionalism among the authors. Um, but as a group, we're certainly not confident about this. Um, it may even be too strong to say that we think it's more likely to be true than not true. But crucially, we think it's plausible enough that it's worth exploring its implications. Um, another consideration is that many scientific theories of consciousness are expressed in computational terms. And also, if computational functionalism is true, then there's an important further question about which AI systems perform the kinds of computations which are associated with consciousness. So ultimately, the reason why we make this assumption is that we think it's a productive one in the sense that by working, starting from this assumption, 
we can reduce our overall uncertainty about consciousness in AI to a significant degree. Um, so, you know, we're uncertain about whether computational functionalism is true. We're uncertain about which specific th scientific theories of consciousness are true. We don't know which AI systems are conscious, but uh, if we kind of explore this area of the space of possibilities, we think we can make progress. So we think we can reduce our overall uncertainty. Next slide. Another question about why we did what we did um, is why did we focus on the internal processes that AI systems go through rather than on their behavior or on their capabilities? Why do we think that thinking about internal processes is a better way of determining whether they're likely to be conscious? Well, this is also an interesting question. And it's because it's interesting because there's this kind of important challenge to the approach that we took, which is that um, the science of consciousness is relatively immature. There are still lots of competing theories in this science. And also crucially, these theories are based mostly, although not entirely, on data from humans. So one might very reasonably have doubts about whether um, these descriptions of what's going on in humans when humans have conscious experiences um, can be extended to provide a guide to consciousness in non-humans. Um, and in particular, that kind of argument has been made in debates about non-human animal consciousness. Uh, our colleague, Jonathan Birch, for example, who's a leading researcher in that area, um, argues that in the case of non-human animals, when you're trying to work out which are conscious, it's more productive with science in its current state to concentrate on um, examining the capabilities of non-human animals than on trying to work out uh, whether the internal processes in their brains are similar or not to the internal processes in human brains. But in fact, we think that different methods make sense in these two cases. That is the case of non-human animals versus the case of artificial intelligence. Um, so next slide, please, Rob. And the key difference, which makes it the case that different methods are appropriate in these two cases, is that um, we know that on the whole, animal brains work in relatively similar ways to human brains. And we can know that because of our shared evolutionary heritage, even prior to doing detailed animal neuroscience. Um, on the other hand, there's a relatively wide space of possible designs for AI systems. There's lots of different possible architectures and methods that you can use in AI in principle. Um, so this kind of space of possible internal processes in AI is much wider than uh, the space of uh, processes which we're likely to find in animal brains. Now, there are a couple of different consequences of this point. One is that um, in the case of AI, it's relatively informative to find similar internal processes going on in a system to the processes which seem to be associated with consciousness in humans. Um, that's just because AIs could relatively easily be different from humans. In the case of animals, finding similar processes is not so informative. Um, but then on the flip side, uh, finding say, similar capabilities and similar behaviors um, to those exhibited by humans in AI is less informative than finding similar capabilities in the case of animals. And that's because it seems that uh, in AI, it's possible for very different underlying processes to give rise to superficially similar behaviors and capabilities. So there's a specific version of this problem, which uh, clearly arises in AI as it exists today, which is that AI systems are sometimes designed specifically to imitate human behavior. So uh, we know that there are AI systems which have um, superficially, but also in a very compelling way, human-like um, capabilities, human-like behaviors, um, which also work in quite unhuman-like ways. For that reason, looking at capabilities looks like a, on the whole, an unreliable method, unless it can be very substantially refined um, in the case of AI. Next slide. 
Okay, uh, now turning to the question of what's next for AI consciousness research. Um, well, I'm sure there are lots of exciting directions which could be pursued at this point, but one which I'm interested in, I think Rob's interested in as well, is um, understanding what's called valenced conscious experience. So, uh, of course, as we're all familiar with, some conscious experiences feel good, like feeling a cool breeze on a hot day. Another conscious experiences feel bad, like feeling pain or fear. Um, these are valence conscious experiences. What we'd say is that the, the ones that feel good have positive valence and the ones that feel bad have a negative valence. But it seems as though in principle, there can also be um, neutral conscious experiences which don't have a valence one way or the other. So the question is, uh, could we find indicators for specifically valenced consciousness in AI? That seems to be a question which goes beyond the uh, general one that we were asking in this report. And we think that this question is important because it seems that pleasure and suffering have special moral significance. Next slide. Now, that brings us to uh, the topic, which is um, which was one of the major motives for our reports and which we're certainly going to be talking about further uh, today, which is this point that uh, a big part of the reason why thinking about AI consciousness matters, why working out how to assess whether AI systems are likely to be consciousness conscious matters, is because our society is soon going to have to decide whether to build systems which could plausibly be conscious. So there's a huge, uh, very difficult philosophical question, uh, which is what moral principles should we use to make this momentous choice? Um, I certainly don't know the answer to that question. Uh, it's possible we'll explore it a little bit in a few minutes. Um, but we do think that there's a, a simple step which could be taken now, um, which is uh, to continue the kinds of work that we've been doing to try to understand um, what might be good indicators of consciousness in AI. Um, and then uh, in particular for uh, groups engaged in building AI systems to recognize the possibility that they might build conscious systems, that they might do so even without trying to do just that. Um, and for those groups to develop methods for assessing whether the systems that they're working on are likely to be conscious and to, uh, you know, we certainly strongly recommend um, that they proceed with great caution if they get a positive result when they're doing that kind of assessment. So um, thanks very much for listening, everyone. Uh, thanks again to our collaborators and uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks. Great, thank you so much, Patrick and uh, Rob. Now, uh, Grace, uh, do you have any thoughts from your perspective to share? Um, yeah, uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about kind of the state of consciousness re research in, in neuroscience to, to give context to um, the theories that are discussed in the report and kind of, I guess, to to situate ourselves maybe in the, the history of science here. Um, so I should say I'm not directly a consciousness researcher myself, but I do study attention, which interweaves with consciousness studies in, in various ways. Um, but so I don't have a, a dog in the fight of these different theories, um, which is possibly a good uh, position to be in to discuss the overall state of things. Um, but yeah, it is the case that the neuroscientific study of consciousness um, in terms of being a proper scientific field of research is pretty new. I mean, you could argue neuroscience itself is pretty new in the whole scheme of, of history of science. Um, but certainly um, people taking the scientific study of consciousness seriously uh, is is definitely new because there, you know, there was a, a joke that you had to be tenured to study consciousness. Um, and so the idea that now there are actually full labs devoted to this and people are really trying to make it rigorous and thorough and you have these competing theories and everything, um, that's definitely progress, but it points to the fact that uh, this research is still in its infancy. Uh, and so the theories that are laid out here are, you know, the major theories that are discussed amongst these researchers. Um, 
But from my perspective, I don't think there's a sense that, you know, these are anywhere close to the final drafts of these theories. Um, and that's important for when you then step through, you know, the conclusions. Um, so and just the fact um, that that Rob said, you know, you're, the report doesn't choose a specific theory to go with because there isn't consensus. There's these multiple theories that in many ways have conflicts with each other. And so um, it really is still a young area. Um, and also, you know, the way that the scientific study is framed um, in order to be, uh, you know, precise and rigorous. Uh, it's usually framed more as studying the neural correlates of consciousness. So not even trying to make a strong claim necessarily about causal connection, but these, you know, just what do you observe the patterns of neural activity to be when a subject reports a conscious experience? And that's another detail. It's really a lot of times the, the neural correlates of conscious report. Um, what are people saying that they experienced as their conscious experience? Um, there is a detail of kind of these no report um, paradigms, but they still ultimately rely on the fact that at some point a human was able to say that they experienced something. Um, and so those are also caveats, you know, that um, bound the scientific study of it and are necessary to make it a scientifically rigorous thing to study. Um, but obviously that's going to, you know, um, from a philosophical perspective, that's going to have implications as well. Um, and yeah, the other thing that I, I kind of wanted to talk about in uh, kind of, yeah, situating this uh, sort of thing. Um, so, you know, the scientists are going into the brain and it's messy and there's a lot of stuff going on. And the hope is to find the um, the simplified principles that uh, correlate with this, you know, conscious report and correlate with people saying something is conscious uh, versus not. And so there the work is to take the big, messy, complex thing and try to come up with the simplest description of what you need in order to, to get conscious report. Um, when you then actually kind of look at that in isolation, um, sometimes those indicators, as the report, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, turns them into, seem really simple. <laughs> and I think there's, you know, we have to keep in mind that these theories were not developed for the purposes of trying to see if an AI system is conscious. They're developed in the context of assuming that a human is conscious and looking at uh, their neural activity, or even, you know, a lot of the, at least the the kind of background knowledge for these theories comes from non-human uh, animal work. Um, and so they're understanding where they're coming from in that sense, the fact that they're not designed to be directly translated into um, these sort of uh, easy to identify computational principles that could be in artificial systems, I think is important. Um, I think it's important for this work of um, uh, trying to, you know, take a theory and assess an artificial system. Um, but I also think that there's a lesson for the people, the, the neuroscientists who study consciousness uh, in this as well, because if this happens a lot when you do mathematical modeling, uh, you know, you can be working with a topic area and kind of think you have a mental model of how it works. And uh, then when you actually go to write it down, you realize, you know, some aspects are lacking, maybe, um, or, or the pieces don't fit together the way that you thought they did. And it's the turning of, you know, the kind of mental model and the pile of experimental data and the word models that people use to describe how they think something functions, when you actually have to turn that into uh, an equation or code or actually try to build it, um, you can kind of see where where you might be missing things. And I think that um, this is a nice opportunity for the neuroscientists who study consciousness to see their theories in a new light when they're kind of put into these cold, stark indicators and really reflect on if that is summarizing everything that they think is important or that there are things about the brain that are kind of going unspoken that they think are actually really important as well, or things about the abilities of humans or animals that that um, are important as well. Um, so yeah, I think that's important to keep in mind that these theories were not designed um, to to lead to a description that is uh, used for AI, um, but it's still a very helpful exercise in my mind to go through this and see what they look like in the end when they're kind of pared down to the simplest form that can be uh, translated into an AI system. So overall, I think the report has benefits, you know, to be able to take this uh, neuroscience literature and and bring it to an AI audience and put it in those terms, um, but also has, should have benefits for the neuroscience side itself 
in terms of thinking about how these theories uh, really pan out, how they relate to each other, what they could be missing, um, if the scientists who you know, created and worked on these theories, if they would agree with the conclusions of the report or even agree that a, a artificial system that had these properties was conscious in the end. I think that that's an important thing for, um, for the, those scientists to reflect on. Great, thank you so much, Grace. And uh, finally, Yashua, do you have thoughts to share? Um, sure. Um, maybe um, I'll start with talking about the computational sort of uh, functionalism, computational basis of consciousness and subjective experience. We've been using the word consciousness, but really I think it's important to uh, clarify that the, the word consciousness can be associated to all sorts of things. And we're trying to focus on, on, on the subjective experience, which is the part that um, may seem very mysterious to uh, many people, including researchers. Um, my uh, personal view, so maybe not the you know unanimous uh, view of the others, is that physics is computation, and many physicists share that view. Uh, you know, it's uh, just a bunch of equations that could be implemented in any way you want. At the end of the day, you get the same. Uh, uh, changes in the state of the world and your brain is physics too. Uh, now, uh, I think some of the questions about uh, uh, how this could be turned into computations in a computer may not have nothing to do with something non-material um, that could possibly be happening in biology. Maybe there is something about the physics, like it requires uh, quantum computations that maybe we don't know yet how to do. But uh, actually, if we look at the progress of AI in the last few decades, uh, we're moving forward quite rapidly towards very strong capabilities, and we never seem to be requiring any kind of uh, quantum computation in order to get uh, that power, which, of course, doesn't guarantee that it's continued to be the case. But uh, that suggests that um, the uh, level of uh, abstraction that, uh, say, neural networks used in uh, machine learning have is already doing a good job for providing a lot of the explanations and neural correlates of uh, our abilities. Um, so uh, another interesting question that has to do with AI research is why are we conscious in the first place? And um, the uh, perspective uh, that you know would come naturally to machine learning researchers or AI researchers is uh, you know evolution uh, notice with these forms of computations because that gives us an advantage either individually or collectively you know there's a social aspect to consciousness as well um, and so if there is an advantage then it's something worth investigating from an AI perspective it may be something that AI researchers want to put into their AI systems which uh, you know, is, is a question I'll come back to um, that Patrick talked about. Um, do we want to have conscious machines or not? Um, so uh, one of the things uh, my group has been working on is precisely this. So, so some of these theories of consciousness, in particular, the global workspace um, uh, theory and uh, attention schema theory uh, and, and others really... Um, uh, can be interpreted as providing an advantage in terms um, of our ability to learn and manipulate abstractions. So this uh, is connected to the property of um, um, thoughts and uh, attention, selecting very few bits of information that go through working memory at any moment. And then you know we sequentially go through a, a very, very small number of bits in this way that uh, help us take decisions um, and organize our understanding of the world at a very abstract level that uh, compresses information raw, uh, you know, perceptual information in a way that helps us better understand the world, take better decisions, um, better model it, and so on. Now, let me go back to this question of um, uh, whether AI, you know, are conscious or will be in, in, in the future. So. Our, our report uh, suggests that none of the current uh, AI systems 
ha have enough of the uh, characteristics that those theories suggest. But um, so first of all, the, the different theories we chose are not the end of it. So this is a continuously moving field. Uh, uh, there you know, are new papers coming uh, regularly suggesting other variants often related to the existing theories. So we shouldn't take these as the end story of uh, how consciousness works in the brain. Um, and um, uh, uh, also what the report suggests is actually those properties, the, the, those in these theories, or maybe other ones that could be related that may come up in the near future, um, those attributes are not impossible to put in AI. So it's, it's very plausible that in coming years, we would be able to build machines that um, compute in in ways that that um, at least uh, suggestive of uh, consciousness in the human sense, and um, I think this raises a lot of uh, important questions. Uh, my my take on this is we should not build conscious machines uh, until we know better. Uh, there are many reasons for this. Uh, um, in particular, whether we um, succeed in uh, building machines that are actually conscious or not, if humans um, perceive those AI systems as conscious, uh, that has a lot of implications that could be extremely destabilizing for society. You know, we um, associate moral status to uh, other conscious beings, and that's uh, connected with a very strong social contract, um, um, which uh, you know works for humans. We we have all kinds of characteristics. We have a finite lifetime. We have finite. We are bounded sort of uh, intellectual capabilities, which and and these properties uh, uh, may not apply to AI that can reproduce. Uh, you know, there's no limit in how you could copy uh, an AI uh, system over and over, uh, so they might be like immortal, they might be much smarter than us, um, all sorts of things that I think would, would make the current um, interpretation of consciousness uh, at a moral and social point, uh, social view uh, questionable. And, and so I think until we know better, um, we shouldn't do that. There's another more pragmatic reason why I think we shouldn't build conscious machines. Because with with consciousness also comes a notion of um, self and uh, even self preservation, objectives like agency. This was one of the theories that was uh, described, and uh, this could be if we if we go that on that route, this could be very dangerous from uh, an AI safety point of view. In other words, we might be building machines that have. Uh, their own goals uh, that uh, are not well aligned with uh, human uh, norms and, and values in, in ways that could be extremely dangerous for humanity. And of course, this is a subject that's uh, intensely debated uh, in the last few months, uh, which uh, you know makes this report particularly interesting. But but uh, the, this is one point I want to I want to uh, emphasize. Um, Let's see, uh, the last point I wanna make uh, that's uh, not really in the report, but uh, connected to what we talk about in the report, but comes from recent work coming out of my group uh, just in the last few months. Um, suggesting, so it, it's it's another theory of consciousness that uh, is completely computational. Um, it's related to uh, several existing theories, but, but what's interesting about this one is that um, subjective experience with all the attributes that we uh, uh, associate with it, like ineffability and uh, subjectivity um, and richness uh, and uh, um, uh, and fleetingness, um, all these properties emerge of this model as side effects of um, a, a, the need to perform a particular kind of computation that is important from a learning perspective. But, but you could obtain potentially the same um, computations in a, with a different implementation that wouldn't have these side effects. So evolution has sort of converged in this particular way of achieving particular uh, useful computations that um, may give rise to our sensation of being conscious and, and having free will and all these things to which we attribute a little bit of uh, uh, sort of uh, magical properties. 
Um, and, and we should be careful about that, that instinct we have about our own perception of being conscious uh, in light of, of those results from neuroscience and AI. I'll stop here. Great. Thank you so much, Yashua, and everybody for those remarks. Very interesting. It gives us a lot to talk about. I want to flag both for the panelists and for everybody in the audience that a very lively discussion is already happening in the Q&A tab. And so I encourage everybody to go check out the Q&A tab and read through some of the questions and comments that have already been entered and feel free to reply directly to each other and have those conversations. We can have one conversation here and another in, in the Q&A tab. I will jump right into questions that attempt to synthesize and present you with what people are asking about in the Q&A tab. I will not be able to get to everything, but please know everybody that we will send all the questions to the panelists after the talk, whether or not we can get to them during the presentation. So uh, some of the questions are descriptive, others of the questions are moral or legal or political in nature. So I can start with a general descriptive question for you. As you noted in the initial presentation and some of your remarks, and as, as several people have, have noted in the comments, you focus on a particular perspective about consciousness according to which consciousness is about computations. And so you look at scientific theories of consciousness that identify different computations, and then you search for markers related to those theories. And then you look for those markers in particular kinds of AI systems. And as some people note, that does not exhaust the, the space of theories and perspectives about consciousness that are plausible and popular right now. So on a more permissive end of the spectrum, as one person notes, there are for example, panpsychist theories of consciousness and other theories that, that are relatively undemanding that allow for the possibility that even quite simple systems could be conscious. And, and so those theories might imply that lots of systems can be conscious whether or not they have your markers, right? And then at the other more restrictive end of the spectrum, you have biological theories according to which for various reasons, you really do need to be made out of for example, carbon-based cells and neurons in order to realize consciousness. And, and according to those theories, a system can hit all of your markers, but still be non-conscious if that system is made out of silicon-based transistors and chips. So I wonder on a personal level to, to the panelists, what kind of credence do you have in these more permissive or more restrictive theories? Do you find them plausible? Do you find them good candidates? And how would you incorporate them into your search for AI consciousness? Uh, I, I can hop in first. If, uh, um, yeah, I think, I think uh, in people in the report, I'm probably on the higher end in my credence for uh, in computational functionalism of some kind. I'm maybe like 70%. Um, but I am very compelled by arguments by people like uh, Anil Seth and uh, Peter Godfrey Smith, um, philosopher of biology, who has written extensively on consciousness. So I do sometimes um, wake up in the middle of the night, uh, you, you know, um, uh, wondering if, if computational functionalism is off on the wrong track. I also just take this opportunity to say um, one thing we call for in the report is more detailed work investigating the assumption of computational functionalism. We think it's, again, sufficiently implausible that it's really very important to explore its implications, but we could also get a lot more clarity on these issues if, um, yeah, arguments for and against computational functionalism got um, hashed out in more detail. Um, and yeah, I'll lastly just say, I, I wanted to plug a really nice remark um, by Anil Seth that I think is really exactly the kind of response uh, we wanted, where he said, I disagree with some of the assumptions, um, and I'm guessing that's computational functionalism, but that's totally fine because I might well be wrong. So we're very excited to see people uh, kind of exploring different parts of the space of, of possibilities that we could be facing with AI consciousness. Great, thank you, Rob. Yashua. Yeah, um, so I'm my credence on computational functionalism is 99.99% um, because, uh, I mean, maybe because I'm, I'm a computer scientist, right? And the whole field of computer science is founded on uh, the idea that computations can be done on any substrate. Um, and there's not been any counterexample of that. 
that exists as far as I know. Um, it's not just AI. It's like it's it dates back from like Turing and the Turing machine um, around the Second World War, and um, it it's also connected to as I said in my little pitch, uh, everything we know from physics. And so I I don't find. Uh, I I don't see how you know having carbon atoms prevents computations from explaining what's going on. It's just a different kind of computation. It may not be the computations going on at the level of uh, these artificial neurons that you typically find in deep learning. That's very possible, but it's still computation. It's just now computation happening at the atomic level. But it's still computation. Whether you know what's the level of abstraction that's needed to replicate human intelligence and consciousness. Well, nobody really knows, and that's open. But I think the question of whether you need uh, something that's non-computational, because for me, if it's not computational, it's not even physical. So it's not even materialistic. And I don't see you know, how you could buy that unless you believe in some spiritual beings explaining our consciousness. Oh, and, and I also have a comment on, on panpsychism. Uh, it's... Uh, how could I say? It feels like it's completely overgeneralizing. Like we, the things we know that are conscious are, you know, human beings, and because of many similarities, we, you know, we we, we have some, you know, maybe good reasons to think that other animals may be conscious. Um, but everything we know about human consciousness um, uh, is you know has the kind of properties that we discuss in the report, for example, that are completely disjoint and, and not applicable to just arbitrary groups of atoms um, or even single, you know, electrons or whatever you know crazy things that you could uh, come to with with these theories. So I'm not saying these theories are false, but they seem so far removed from the like. Uh, biological reality, or like what happens when a person is conscious or not conscious, that I, it, 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 for me, they, they like they don't they don't rate very high as uh, scientific theories that are supposed to explain what we know about consciousness. They may feel good again because I think it's sort of uh, it may make us feel good uh, with our like intuitive religious understanding of the world, but but in terms of matching what we observe, the correlates of consciousness, it seem pretty much uh, bringing zero information. All right, great, thank you. Uh, Grace or Patrick, did you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, sure, I'll, um, I mean, so uh, when you asked about credences in computational functionalism, um, I guess the thought is that to the extent that we're doubtful about computational functionalism, maybe we're doubtful about the value of this project to uh, kind of reveal whether AI systems are likely to be conscious or not, and therefore whether they're likely to have a certain special kind of moral significance or not. And for me, I think how my credences fit together is something like this. Um, uh, if there's such a thing as consciousness, if the concept of consciousness makes sense and is a useful one to apply beyond the human case, then I think uh, most likely it's a computational phenomenon. I think I'd give more credence to the computational view um, in that situation to, than to non-computational views. Um, because I think the computational views have got more promise in explaining the properties of consciousness. Um, but, what keeps me awake at night, to go back to what Rob said, is uh, the possibility that conscious that the concept of consciousness is somehow confused, or that um, um, it doesn't make sense to apply it beyond the human case, um, that it's um, unproductive for moral theorizing, or uh, uh, conceptually confused in some way to ask the question whether AI systems um, are conscious or not. But, but but Patrick, I don't think these two views are incompatible. So I actually think that consciousness is, uh, you know, computational in nature, and that is confusing 
and kind of not clear that it's meaningful to extend that concept uh, very far from human beings. Because, I mean, especially regarding the, the, the moral aspects of things, that's what I mean, and the social and moral aspects. I don't think these right. are incompatible yeah. points of views. Uh, yeah, I think our, I think our views are pretty pretty similar. Yeah. Grace, did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, I mean, in terms of computational functionalism, my gut is that it's it's largely correct, or certainly there will at least need to be a common set of computations, and then maybe there also needs to be other stuff. But on the whole, I just feel like we're several paradigm shifts away from really understanding uh, all of this. So it's hard for me to say anything with any confidence or vigor. <laughs> yeah, that, that seems like the, the answer about which we can be most confident. <laughs> uh, okay, great. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I, I can now ask a question on the moral, legal, political side. And again, several people have, have asked questions along those lines as well. So I think as you yourself said, part of why so many people are so interested in this topic is because we do associate consciousness and then related capacities like sentience, the ability to consciously experience positively and negatively valenced states like pleasure and pain and happiness and suffering. Many people associate that reasonably, in my view, with a certain kind of intrinsic moral and legal and political significance. The idea being that if you have consciousness and or sentience, if there is something it is like to be you, and if it can feel good or bad to be you especially, then you matter for your own sake and I should consider your interests and needs and vulnerabilities when making decisions that affect you. And that might extend to a decision about whether to create you in the first place, as well as a decision about how to treat you if and when I do create you. And so I would like to ask, all of you, if, if you care to respond, first of all, do you associate consciousness or sentience with that kind of intrinsic moral or legal or political significance? Do you think that when a being is consciousness or sentient or sufficiently likely to be conscious or sentient by our lights, that we should extend them a certain kind of intrinsic value and consider their potential interests, needs, vulnerabilities when making decisions that affect them. And since we are making these decisions under uncertainty, I also wanted to ask a little bit about how you think about the risks associated with false positives and false negatives, with potential over or under attribution of consciousness and moral status. What are the risks associated with accidentally seeing an object as a subject? And what are the risks associated with accidentally seeing a subject as an object? And how do you weigh those when deciding how to calibrate this kind of test and practice? So yeah, do you associate this with moral status and how do you deal with this under uncertainty? Yashua. Well, I'm not a philosopher, so you know, uh, take that from uh, uh, the angle of a computer scientist, but... Um, my interpretation of this question is we are asking the wrong question. Um, it's not whether we should attribute moral status to um, entities that, that have particular properties like being conscious or something like that. Is that that's how we are. That's, you know, humans are compelled to uh, have empathy and compassion for other types of beings, in particular, other human beings, because that's something that evolution put in us, because it was uh, it helped us to you know, help humanity to to uh, succeed, and maybe you know become a dominant species. So, I mean, there are exceptions. You, know, you have sociopaths and so on, but for the most part, humans have those innate feelings, and by association, because you know our brain works by association, we often generalize that to other entities that look like us, uh, mammals in particular, or, um, um, you know, we also have a very strong empathy for babies of uh, other species, right? Uh, uh, my partner would not eat meat, but especially if it's coming from the, the baby of the species, right? It's not 
coming from a philosophical kind of argument. It's just an innate thing that we have. I can I can share that feeling, maybe not as strongly as she does. I think females in general. Um, so I think we're just asking the wrong question. And when we come to uh, this for machines, I think it would be a huge mistake to build things that would play into our innate uh, response mechanisms towards entities that look like us. So there was this um, uh, Black Mirror episode where um, there are uh, you know AI clones of a person in you know in a virtual world uh, that we feel for uh, because they are so human like even though it's just a simulation, right? Uh, we we can't like prevent ourselves from attributing a, a moral status to those virtual agents because they look human. Um, and I think that's the reality. What we do with that, uh, I think, is uh, then social norms to not break the way our society works with the introduction of entities that don't correspond to you know we evolved something we evolved for but but it is not going to be true anymore with with machines that could be potentially imitating us in many ways and maybe even have some of the the attributes we put in the report but is that really what society you know needs um i, I think that's a big question mark thank you very interesting rob yeah, so I think um, my views on this are, are, are similar to Yashua's in, in many ways. On the question of what um, the grounds of moral status are, as, as philosophers would say, um, for my own part, I'm like quite confident that if an entity is sentient, uh, that is, if it has valence conscious experiences like pleasure and pain, that that alone is sufficient for us to uh, care about it and show concern for it. Um, which is why I would be excited for the, the project that uh, Patrick mentioned. I'm less clear on how to think about uh, entities that are merely conscious, that maybe only have neutral experiences. You could imagine a future large language model, maybe that fits more of our indicators, that only had experiences of uh, like understanding or maybe even some very abstract conscious experience that we can't even comprehend. I would obviously be extremely careful in how I treated that thing, but I'm a little bit less sure how to think about that case. And then lastly, I just wanted to flag, um, you know, one very characteristic element of how we like to think about this in the report is, you know, about uncertainty and managing all of the different cases that, that might come up. And so I also wanted to flag consciousness itself could be too narrow of a thing to focus on. And we don't want to put all of our focus on that. There are, I think, compelling arguments that even if something is not conscious, um, if it has desires or goals um, that it, it wants to pursue, then that itself is something that should be uh, should be respected. So I would also love to see um, you know equivalent or analogous reports on whether AI systems could have the kind of preferences or desires that might uh, merit consideration. It's already wonder... it's already the case. I mean uh, that lots of reinforcement learning agents have valence and have goals. It's like not no no rocket science here. It already exists. So just very quick on that, I will, I'll just direct you to Patrick's work. Uh, Patrick is an expert on that sort of thing. And then we just one very last point, which is uh, just to kind of reiterate what Yashua was saying. Um, Yashua has recently been writing very eloquently and forcefully about risks from risks from AI to humans uh, in terms of uh, their their behavior being aligned with our interests and things like that. And yeah, adding consciousness or sentience into that mix is potentially extremely dangerous because it could morally constrain that project uh, and also just lead us to act in certain ways uh, that are dangerous to ourselves. So there's a lot of interesting things to say about the relationship between risks from AI and risks to AI, let's say. Um, and it's very good that people not conflate those two questions. One kind of convergent policy proposal for both of those is that we need to just be extremely careful, uh, slow down, think very hard about what we're doing, have more transparency and reflection about what we're doing. I think that's something that's very important for both of those issues. Uh, if I may, uh, I'd like to articulate in two sentences why you know the, the concern uh, from a safety point of view that Robert just talked about. 
So if we build machines um, and uh, we we start seeing attributes of of consciousness, and then we just complete the picture to give them um, essentially all of our attributes of consciousness. In other words, they have their own goals. In particular, they have a self preservation goal. And if those machines are smarter than us in sufficient ways to be dangerous to us, uh, then we are in a very very uh, risky situation from the point of view of uh, humanity losing control of its future because there would be something like a new species um, of entities that may have goals that don't uh, match, uh, you know, that may, may lead harm to humans. And, and so we don't want to do that, obviously. Great. Thank you. Grace? Yeah, so uh, the... I think there's a, a pragmatic answer that, you know, allows for the current high level of uncertainty. And that's, you know, if these systems seem conscious to us, then we need to follow that logic through, even if we don't know the truth of the matter. So, yeah, like if it's a very human like system, it's natural that people are going to feel that it's conscious. Um, I mean, I think you could have a system that is conscious and doesn't have some of the things that you were listing, Yashua, like the, the self-preservation, you know, angle or anything like that. So I don't think necessarily if it's a conscious system, it has those things, or if it has those things, it's conscious or anything like that. But certainly we would feel like it is. And the question is, um, you know, what are the benefits or risks to society if you tell people they have to treat this thing like it's conscious or that they don't? So if you have something that feels conscious, looks and behaves like a human, and we tell people you can do whatever you want to this thing, it has no moral status, um, is that going to lead to people, you know, some people make the argument that you can use that as kind of a catharsis where people could treat the the non-sentient robot terribly and then they won't do that to humans. Other people think you might start to devalue actual conscious life if you give people things that seem conscious and tell them that they can treat them poorly. Uh, so I think that's the pragmatic answer given the level of uncertainty. Um, if there was a world where we could be certain that something is conscious, even if it doesn't feel like it is to us or looks like us in any way, um, I think then the the next steps are more complicated because it doesn't just slot into, okay, it has moral status the same as a human now. Because, you know, a lot of the things that we associate with something having moral status and how we treat the being with moral status, um, you know, it's about being humane to them. It's about being treating them the way that humans would want to be treated. And they might have completely different, you know, things that need to be done or not done to them um, to be considered moral to a completely different type of consciousness and intelligence, potentially. Um, so if there, if, even if we can say with certainty that an artificial system is conscious, I don't know if we know very clearly what follows from that. Even if we agree that we're going to treat it as a moral agent, I don't know if we know clearly what follows from that. Yeah, great, great point. And th this is a lesson that we have learned often the hard way over the past several decades on the animal minds and the animal ethics side of things. And I think we need to relearn or remember those questions on the AI minds and AI ethics side of things. And, and I appreciate everybody for articulating that here, that there might be broad similarities between the minds of biological and non-biological beings, but a lot of the details might be different, even if there is some kind of valenced subjective experience, the actual interests and needs are going to be very different. The levels of intelligence and power are potentially going to be very different. It might disrupt expectations we have about what it means to have a moral relationship or a legal political relationship with someone. So it might be that in some broad thin sense, the concepts extend, but in any kind of more detailed or thicker sense, we have to rethink everything, right? Okay, we have about five minutes left. And again, tons of questions and comments. We, we will not be able to, to even scratch the surface, but I can ask one more detailed question about your discussion of global workspace theory that came up several times in, in the comments. Several people asked a question of the forum. You mentioned that large language models do not have the relevant kind of feedback loop at the kind of transistor level, but what about at other levels of 
explanation. What about, for example, the actual application of the models and how they draw from their own past responses when making predictions? Is there a kind of feedback loop happening there that might be relevant for global workspace theory? There, there were a few questions of that form. So it'd be great if, if somebody could address that. Yeah, I'll say something very quick and then I'm going to pass the baton to Patrick just as a heads up. So a quick clarification, it's not actually about the transistor level. It's about the level of the uh, like virtual neurons. It's in that sense that it's um, that it's feed forward. And then one thing that um, I haven't actually looked at those questions, but there was an interesting discussion on Twitter that happened um, where, yeah, you might think that the place you get the feedback loops is the fact that the model will output a word and then look back over the entire string and then output the next word. So it, you could argue that it's using the whole text output um, as a kind of global workspace. Uh, and if you're interested in like the extended mind, you could maybe make an argument that that's a kind of global workspace. That said, I think that's there's kind of challenges to that view, which I will uh, punt to Patrick. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, it seems just seems to me that um, any system which interacts with an environment in the sense that it's outputs influence the environment and therefore have a knock-on effect on its subsequent inputs is one in which there's a kind of recurrent causal loop connecting the system itself with this environment. Um, and it seems as though if we allow that to be the kind of loop which is described in the global waste space theory, then we're just giving a uncharitable interpretation of the of the global waste space theory because that's that's not what they intend. Um, it said the the thought in the global waste space theory is that there's a internal recurrent loop within the system between um, the modules and the global waste space. Um, but but although although Rob has suggested that I'm the best person to answer this question, um, really the most qualified person here to answer the question by far is Joshua because he understands uh, both the global waste space theory and the um, AI systems. Yeah, uh, much better I, than, than I, me. I agree with your answers. Um, so I I have a, a machine learning interpretation of the the bottleneck in the global workspace theory, and um, it, it it allows for um, a, a, a forcing particular kinds of dependencies and abstractions to emerge, very sparse dependencies that involve like very few variables. Um, it forces that to emerge because of the bottleneck at, at the internal level. If you if you were to consider the output words of a transformer as the bottleneck, it, it doesn't really work for uh, a number of reasons because this is what it's outputting. It's like if you were to force to say everything that comes into your working memory, um, and, and also that it could be expressed as words, which is not completely obvious. Um, so it's really a different schema. It, it, as you say, the fact that it's an internal bottleneck uh, makes a whole difference. And the actions that are taken are not just a copy of that bottleneck, but they might be, you know, what is appropriate in the context? Uh, you might be lying, for example, or, you know, it, it, you might realize that your thought has something incoherent and you might want to say something different. Uh, you wouldn't have that if you interact with uh, chat GPT. Um, although people are actually trying to design things like this that are closer to an internal uh, thinking train of thought uh, with transformers and with chat GPT in particular to try to emulate some of the properties of the um, uh, workspace uh, for helping to reason. So th th there is movement in that direction, but it's not really the same. Right. Okay, so, great. So, what, so I was just going to say one response, which we sometimes get when we say uh, a system like a transformer-based large language model or something doesn't meet the criteria, people, people are often quick to respond by saying, well, you could change the system in such and such a way, and then maybe it would meet the criteria. And, and we don't disagree with that at all. We, we think that the... Uh, are relatively clear steps which could be taken using existing AI techniques to build systems which would be uh, which would meet more of the indicator properties um, than the than the ones which exist at the moment. 
Yeah, I, I would add that there are other properties that are not really discussed in the global workspace theory, which would be missing, and in, in my opinion, uh, especially about subjective experience. So the global workspace theory doesn't explain subjective experience, at least uh, not all the properties that are associated with it. And um, so I, I mentioned earlier things like ineffability, like the fact that we are conscious of something richer than what we are able to express with words, at least in you know a limited number of words. And um, it, that's something you don't get with transformers, especially if you put the bottleneck at the output. Um, you might get something like this if you suddenly had a huge hidden layer in, you know, in, in the middle somewhere that could play that role. That is possible. Um, um, yeah, there are also other properties of uh, conscious thought that, that are not expressed in transformers as they are now. For example, attention in transformers is what we call soft attention, actually something invented in my lab in 2014. Um, and it's not at all like the kind of attention that makes a hard decision, usually somewhat stochastic, about what we're going to attend next, either in the perceptual or you know in in something about our interpretation, our thoughts, our memories, and um, that that is very very different in nature from the the kind of attention that are currently working well in AI. But doesn't mean that it won't be in future systems, right? But just saying they're not present currently. Thank, thank you for, for that exchange. We, we are a little bit over time now. So Grace, I'm going to give you the last word and uh, then we can wrap up if you still have a comment. Yeah, I just wanted to make a quick point about this idea of there kind of being this external recurrence because you can um, resample your environment that you impacted. Um, I think, you know, if you're looking at the architecture of the model, that is a pretty big difference from there being internal recurrence. But if you take the perspective of like a naive neuroscientist who was trying to understand this system and they only had access to the activity of the neurons over time, which is what happens a lot in neuroscience, um, you might think that there is internal recurrence because there would be correlations between activity of neurons over time and that kind of thing, or at least in the information represented in, in the system over time. And so on some like fuzzier, more abstract level, maybe it does look like there's recurrence, but we actually know the architecture that generates it. And if you're subscribing to theories of consciousness where the architecture that generates it matters, then it's a different, you know, different outcome. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Grace. And, and okay, this is the time now to thank everybody again for taking the time to join us and tell us about your report, answer some of our questions. Thanks also again to everybody in the audience for showing up. We had really amazing attendance and a fantastic conversation happening. And apologies for not being able to get at all of the even general topics of the questions to say nothing of the specific questions. Uh, but, but it really was a great conversation and we will share all the questions and comments and exchanges with the panelists following the talk. And so, so again, yes, thank you to everybody. This is obviously the beginning of a much longer conversation about various tests for conscious and sentient AI systems and what follows for their moral, legal, political significance. So really looking forward to having those conversations. Grateful to everybody for participating in them. Just a note to everybody that you can find a link to the report in the chat, so please do check out the report. You can also find uh, a link to the Mind Ethics and Policy Program. You can sign up to our email list for future events. We will be having in early October a talk by Peter Godfrey Smith, a, a philosopher who is more skeptical about AI consciousness and will explain his skepticism to us. So, so do sign up for that email list if you wanna keep having this conversation with us. And with that, I hope everybody has a great start to your fall, great start to your semester. I have to go teach class now, so I will sign off. Uh, but thank you again to everybody and, and have a great rest of the night. And thanks again to our co-sponsors as well, Bioethics and Mind, Brain and Consciousness. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks so much, Jeff. All right, I think I'm gonna go. Yeah, goodbye everyone. Bye, Rob, it's just us, bye. See ya. <laughs>